Good to be with you. Uh, we're going to look at Jonah chapter 3 and 4. Tonight we looked at 1 and 2 a few weeks ago, and for those of you who aren't here, I'll give you a very brief summary, or for those of you who heard, perhaps you've forgotten a lot's happened between now and then. Uh, we will do that in a moment. So open your Bibles or an app if you can to Jonah chapter 3, please. I'll read chapters 3 and 4 for us, and then we'll pray for God's help and look at what the Lord has to say to us through this ancient prophet who still speaks today. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, if we are honest with you and honest with ourselves, there is a Jonah in all of us. And we pray that in this moment, as we look at this word, which is so much like a mirror, 
you would cause us to bring our hearts of stone before you. And we humbly ask that through the refining fire of your Spirit-backed Word, even tonight, this night, you would turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh and align them with yours. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A strange little book, Joan, isn't it? Written almost 3,000 years ago, on the other side of the world, a far-off place, a far-off land, far-off country we've never heard of, an interesting language, an odd name for a guy. And the man of God runs. An odd book, a strange book, a surprising book, a short book. A man of God runs unheard of. For those of you who weren't here a few weeks ago for Jonah 1 and 2, let me briefly summarize it. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Jonah in chapter 1, verse 1. Arise, go to Nineveh. And Jonah went the other way and tried in vain to run from God. And we see that God was driven in his heart of mercy to pursue Jonah. He pursued him to the depths of the water and put him in a fish to rescue him. God was pursuing the sailors, and the sailors, surprisingly, at the end of chapter 1, prayed to God and repented and came to faith, while the prophet preferred to be thrown overboard rather than repent and pray to God. And then God rescued Jonah with this fish, and Jonah, from the belly of the fish, prayed this wonderful prayer that sounded very repentant-like and said at the very end, salvation belongs to the Lord because God rescued him from drowning and Jonah was spat onto the dry land. And so what happens next in the story? What happens in Jonah's heart? There's this tension that's been building from the opening of chapter 1. Why did Jonah disobey the word of God the first time? Why did he run the other way? Why would he rather be thrown overboard into the sea than along with the sailors to pray and ask God for help? When we get to chapter 3, it starts looking good, doesn't it? The word of the Lord comes a second time. The God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances comes to this wayward prophet again and says, go and do what I asked you to do the first time. And Jonah goes and he preaches this time. And we see, and we'll discuss it more in a moment, that the Ninevites, from the greatest to the least, repent, and God relents of the disaster that he was going to bring on this idolatrous nation. It all looks good. And if Jonah ended with chapter 3, it would be a beautiful children's storybook, wouldn't it? It would be a beautiful little happily ever after. But chapter 4 is uncomfortable because it's not a neat and tidy finish. We don't have this perfect happily ever denouement. We have this question. We have this prophet who's angry. And all is revealed. So let's just go back into context again to remind ourselves where we are in the story. Again, this was written sometime in the 8th century BC, almost 3,000 years ago. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which at this moment in time was becoming the most powerful, dreaded, and fearsome nation the world had ever seen. They were bitter enemies with the Israelites. They were encroaching onto their territory. And Jonah had been telling Jeroboam II, who was the king at that time, and an evil king at that, that we're going to get the land back, and God wants you to go for it. And he did. And Amos, a contemporary of Jonah, came to the other ear of Jeroboam II and said, actually, no, you're not going to get the land back. God's going to judge you with the Assyrians, which he did sometime later. Suffice it to say, Jonah and Israel are no fans of Nineveh. And so to be asked to go into that foreign land and preach to Nineveh sounds like a crazy task. And Jonah is not up for it. These are their enemies after all. These are idolatrous people. Why in the world would we want to go and preach to them? 
So Jonah finally goes in chapter 3, and his prophecy takes up all of one verse. And yet, people repent. More on that in a moment. But this book is filled with surprises. There's a surprise of Jonah running. There's a surprise of pagan sailors driven by fear, repenting at the end of chapter 1 and making a sacrifice to God. But one of the biggest surprises in this book is this, I think. Everyone and everything in this book obeys God, except for the prophet. The wind obeys him. The seas obey him. The sailors obey him. The big fish obeys him. The cattle, the king of Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, the worms, the plants, the sun, and the wind. Absolutely everyone and everything in this book obeys Jonah, except for the man of God. And so as we said, there's this tension. Who will go to the nations? God had promised way back in his call to Abraham that he would call the nations to himself. Who's going to go? The man of God is failing. Israel's failing. So now as we get to chapter 3 and 4, we need to ask the question, what's the book of Jonah all about as a whole? It's about God and his character of mercy and the fact that his prophet doesn't share his heart. And so here we have what I like to call a tale of two hearts. There's God's heart, and there's Jonah's heart, and Jonah does not share God's heart of mercy, and God wants him to. And that's one of the reasons why God pursues Jonah to the question mark at the very end of the book. It's why he doesn't give up on him. Because he's merciful, because he's gracious, because he's abounding in steadfast love, as Jonah quotes, and because he wants to mold the heart of this wayward prophet into a heart of flesh so it's aligned with God's heart of mercy for the nations. So chapter 3 follows a very simple repetition. There's a call and a response. God calls Jonah, go and preach, Jonah goes. Jonah calls out to Nineveh, yet 40 days are you overthrown. The people of God respond in repentance. The word comes to the king. He responds by making a proclamation. The people receive the proclamation and they respond by repenting. God responds to their repentance with relenting of the disaster. So that's the flow of chapter 3. It's call and response, call and response, call and response. And as I said, Jonah's sermon is terribly short. I'm not sure, but I wonder if it's the shortest one in the Bible. Verse 4, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Why is it so short? Might it smell of reluctance? Look at what's not there. The Lord's never mentioned. There's no discussion of sin. There's no call to repentance. So what are Jonah's motives for going the second time around? Has there been a change of heart? That's the big question that drives the tension of chapters 3 and 4. And maybe, just maybe, the issue is this. In the original language, the word overthrown is synonymous with transformation. Might it be? Jonah notes, if he preaches this message and warns of an overthrow, maybe the result will be a transformation. And so a short sermon, a terse sermon, filled with judgment, but no grace. 
might it be possible that Jonah knows that the result of preaching judgment might be beauty rather than ashes? So Nineveh is confronted by God through the prophecy of Jonah. And when the people hear it and the king hears it, the response is strikingly similar to the captain of the sailors in chapter 1. Remember, the captain woke up Jonah and he said, what are you doing sleeping? Call out to your God. Perhaps he'll relent. And when the king hears the message, he says almost the exact same thing. And what does he say in verse 8? It's a call to repentance, isn't it? Let everyone turn from his evil way and the violence that is in his hands. That's the language of repentance. Repentance doesn't mean to be sorry. That's something else. Repentance means to turn. To turn away from evil, to turn away from unbelief, and to turn to God in faith and repentance of sin. And this is the language. Turn from your evil way, from the violence set in your hands, and look at verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger. So maybe God will repent from wanting to bring judgment and justice on us to having mercy on us that we may not perish. The totality of repentance in Nineveh is notable. From the greatest to the least, all of the people and even the cattle. Compare that to Israel at the time, who under the evil king Jeroboam II had been worshipping the golden calves of Aaron for about 150 years. And we have that common refrain of the kings of Israel, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so it went from generation to generation to generation. Not the Ninevites. They hear this staggeringly short message of judgment and they repent from the greatest to the least. It's extraordinary. And how does God respond? Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, repented, he relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. Why not? Because in the words of Ezekiel, God does not desire the death of a sinner, but rather they did turn from his wickedness and live. Peter the Apostle says that God desires that none would perish. God does not desire judgment. He does not desire to punish people. He's not eager to destroy his enemies. That's why Luther called it his strange work. And there is divine precedent for this kind of merciful behavior to a people undeserving. You remember in Exodus, Moses stood in the breach when God was about to destroy all of Israel for their idolatry, and he said to Moses, I'll start with you all over again. It was kind of like the language of covenant with Abraham. And Moses stood in the breach, and he prayed for Israel when God threatened destruction. You see, for God, justice is better served by reformed characters than by corpses. That's how God responds. What about the man of God? Now we get to chapter 4. The uncomfortable bit. The unhappy bit. Three, two simple scenes. One in the city and one outside the city. And each scene ends with a question. Now it's time for a one-to-one -one between God and his prophet. 
So verse 10 ends with God relented of the disaster he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. In the words of the Gospels, there's a party in heaven. Everybody is rejoicing with the Lord over the repentance of Nineveh and the salvation from the greatest to the least, almost everyone except for Jonah. How does Jonah respond to God's grace and mercy? Look at verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. He's not a little surprised. He's not a little upset. He's not a little disappointed. He is displeased exceedingly, and he is angry. He's angry with God for relenting of the disaster he said he would bring on Nineveh because of their evil. Up until this point, the reader might have wondered, why did Jonah run the first time? Such an odd thing. He ran away from God's call. But then he went to Nineveh the second time around after praying in the fish. So maybe that prayer in in chapter 2 was a prayer of repentance, right? Jonah realized he was wrong, and so he repented, and everything sorted, and he's right with God now. And because he's right with God now, and his heart's right, he'll go to Nineveh and do what God asked. Or so we thought. He hasn't repented at all. How do we know that? Because he says so. And verse 2, can you hear the resentment in his voice? Isn't this just what I said? Have you had anyone say that to you? (laughs) Is it a happy sentence? No, right? This is just what I said. I knew what? that you are a gracious God. I knew that you'd be merciful. I knew that you'd be slow to anger. I knew that you're abounding in steadfast love. And I knew that you'd relented from disaster. That's a direct quote from the Lord himself when he speaks to Moses as his glory passes by in Exodus and he decides not to bring disaster on Israel for worshiping the golden calves. Let me ask you, what's the proper response to that declaration? Praise, right? Oh Lord, we praise you and thank you that you're a merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. You're merciful. There's been songs written on that declaration. There's no praise here, friends. I'm angry. I knew that's what you do to Nineveh. How dare you? That's why I didn't want to go in the first place. That's why I ran. I knew. And how does he feel about it? He is exceedingly angry. Do you hear his heart? And yet, Israel's no better. They're idolaters too. They're wicked too. They're doing evil too. And they have received God's covenant mercy again and again and again. But to share that with them? No way. Why wasn't Nineveh destroyed? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. And my friends, it's a very good thing that God's economy works that way because all of us deserve judgment. 
all of us deserve God's wrath and punishment because all of us have sinned and turned away from the Lord. And so it's a very good thing that mercy triumphs over judgment. The Gospels, right there in the Old Testament, But why do we always forget that the gospel's scandalous? Why do we forget that mercy is scandalous? Why is it that my heart gets hardened as I get used to God's grace in my life? People were scandalized that that tax cheat Zacchaeus invited Jesus in his house, and Jesus went. The religious people of God were scandalized that Jesus ate meals with prostitutes. And they thought in their hearts, if only you knew what that woman did for a living, you would never sit down with her. And Jesus said, oh, yes, I would, and gladly. What about the tax collectors and the sinners? What about the scandalous love that looked upon the crowds and was filled with compassion? What about the scandalous love that looked while he sweat and bled at people who mocked at him and spit on him and cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. My brothers and sisters, in God's economy, Mercy always triumphs over judgment. God takes pleasure in people repenting. God takes pleasure in adopting people into his kingdom. But we get out of step, don't we? Like Jonah. And that's why chapter 2, verse 9 is a critical verse to understand the story of Jonah and the heart of Jonah. He ends his prayer by saying, salvation belongs to the Lord. That's exactly right. And that's one of the central points of this book, is for Jonah and Israel and for us to understand, salvation belongs to the Lord, not to us. Not to our preferences, not to our sense of fair play. God will have mercy on whom he pleases. He's the potter. He's the creator. He will do whatever he wants. He has the divine freedom to do so. He is in no way bound to us or the fact that we're already his. God is free to act as He wills. He's free to have mercy on who He wants to have mercy. He's free to give salvation to Vladimir Putin if He wants to. And who are we to talk back to Him? Because we're no different. None of us. So it doesn't matter what our framework is or what our fancy of who should be in and who should be out. Salvation has never been the exclusive possession of any one group. We don't exist at the expense of others. We're all children of grace. And so if we find ourselves tonight or this week or last month or next year feeling there are people in our lives, an individual, a family member, a coworker, a nation, a group of people, whatever it is, who don't deserve mercy. Or if we find ourselves in our inner or external prayer life appealing God to ruin our enemies, this book is a stinging rebuke. Do you remember the story of Nathan going to David after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed so he could have her? And Nathan told the story of a rich man stealing a poor man's sheep and taking them for his own. Do you remember? And David was furious. And he said, who is that man? You bring him to me. And Nathan said, it's you. That's what the book of Jonah is like. If we're really 
to read it with open-hearted honesty, in some way, God is saying to all of his people in all times, this is you. There's a Jonah in you. And as I've wrestled with this passage this week, I've realized in my life there have been times when I felt exactly like Jonah has about people, if I'm honest. And I think, not them. You've got to be kidding me. So listen to the lesson. Do you remember ISIS about 10 years ago? Wreaking havoc in Egypt. And there was one morning when they put 40 Christians on a beach and put uh, coverings over the head and they beheaded them. Do you remember that? Terrible injustice to Christians. In that same week that happened, I heard two starkly different responses that betrayed two different hearts. And the first one was this. I went to meet a group of pastors to do a workshop on Jonah. And it was Monday morning, and I went to this church that was hosting the conference. And I was making my coffee. It's about 8 in the morning, and all the pastors were rolling in. And they're all chit-chatting and shooting the breeze as they made their coffee too. And they didn't know who I was. And they're standing there, and they're talking about what ISIS just did. And two of them were former troops. And one was injured, so he couldn't go back. But they were talking. And I heard them, and they said, man, if I could re-up, I'd re-up tomorrow. I'd go over there, and I'd blow them all away. And I stood there stirring my cream and my coffee, and I thought, oh, you're not going to like the Jonah workshop this week. (laughs) Short while later, a Coptic church was bombed on Good Friday in Cairo. Remember that? Dozens were killed and injured. And Pastor Mark, the pastor of that church, gave a response to ISIS. And it couldn't be more different. You can look it up on YouTube. He gave a whole sermon about to summarize it. He said four things. He said, here's our message to you, ISIS, after you bombed us. Number one, we forgive you. Because our Savior calls us to forgive our enemies. Number two, we love you. Number three, we thank you for hastening us, some of us, into the Lord's presence now. And fourth, he said, we're praying for you. That's a heart in line with God's. That's a heart that understands the scandal of the gospel. And it's why God says to Jonah in verse 4, who says he'd rather die than live, do you do well to be angry? It's a great question. And it gets right to the center of Jonah's heart. And it gets right to the center of the book. Why are you so angry that I had mercy on those people? It's because he didn't share God's heart of mercy. I want to say, Jesus knows this is an ongoing problem with all of his people. And it's why he told three parables in the gospel that get at this. The first one is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Do you remember that one? So it was a servant who was uh, forgiven years and years and years of, of worth of debt, right? A debt that was unpayable. And he begged for mercy. And Jesus said the man who the debt was owed to forgave the man his entire debt. Extraordinary, extravagant act of grace and mercy. And that servant who'd been forgiven a great deal found someone else who owned him about a hundred bucks and grabbed him by the throat and shook him and said, you better pay every penny after you've been forgiven so much. And Jesus said, when the man who forgave the greater debt heard it, he was furious and he said, bring that evil servant to me. Because that man had forgotten how much grace hadn't been shown to him and became mean about something little. Jesus told another parable about the vineyard owner and the laborers, remember? And he promised everyone who began at the work of the day, you'll get a denarius, which is a day's labor. Some people didn't show up till three, four o'clock in the afternoon. People had been working Saint Saint in the morning. 
And when it came to the end of the day in time to pay the salaries, remember, Jesus gave every, or the owner gave everybody the same wage, whether you showed up at eight in the morning or four in the afternoon. And the people who showed up in the morning thought, well, I've been here all day faithfully working, so I should get more, right? And they didn't, and they grumbled. And Jesus says, the, the owner of the vineyard can do whatever he pleases. I promised you a day's wage, you got a day's wage. Why are you grumbling about the fact that I gave someone who came later the same amount? Third parable, the prodigal son. Remember the older brother? All these years I have been faithful to you in all things. And this son of yours who blew it all comes back and you're holding a party. Exactly. Why did Jesus tell those three parables? Because he knows there's a Jonah in all of us. And so we've got to ask ourselves, do we struggle with seeing people come late to the party? Or who we think shouldn't even be at the party and getting the same inheritance of grace and mercy as we did? That's the question. So God goes on and he makes this plant. And of course, it relieves Jonah. And in verse 6, he's exceedingly glad because of that plant. And then God takes it down with a worm, verse 7. And verse 8, he brings a scorching wind and hot sun. And Jonah is faint. And again, he'd rather die than live. What's God doing to Jonah here? Is he tormenting him? Not at all. He's pruning his heart. He's showing him, you enjoy my mercy, but when I took it away for a moment and gave you a little taste of what might happen to Nineveh, suddenly you don't like the way the shoe fits. That's what he's doing. And so God's turning the screw, so to speak. He's turning up the heat in the kitchen, so to speak, to show Jonah the state of his heart. And when God prunes, it's always for the purpose of healing. But sometimes healing stings. And that's what's happening to Jonah. Angry in a moment, happy the next, and angry again, and he'd rather die. And so God asks again, great question, verse 9, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah says, yes, I'm angry enough to die. That's a hard place to be. And those are Jonah's final words. I want to ask you, what would you like your final words to be? Rich Mullins sang a song years ago called The Love of God, and there's a beautiful verse in there that came to mind as I wrote this this week, and he says this, There's a wideness in God's mercy I cannot find in my own. So he keeps the fire burning to melt this heart of stone. And so Jonah wants to die. And verse 10, the denouement, the Lord says, you pity a plant. <laughs> You're not a gardener. You didn't plant it. You didn't water it. You didn't feed it. It came in a day and it left in a day. Shouldn't I pity Nineveh? Jonah doesn't understand that God who cares for the many, 120,000 people, also cares for the one, Jonah. And it's why he pursues Jonah to the very end of the book. Verse 11. 
God is not finished with him yet, even though he's in a very dark place. And I want to encourage you that if that's you in this moment of time, God is not done with you yet. He is going in his grace to continue to pursue you and to prune you and to love you and to let it sting till it heals so he can fashion his heart to become, your heart to become like his. To bring beauty from the ashes. He will pursue you with his extravagant love until his grace breaks you and makes you new again. Should I not pity Nineveh? Jonah, I made these people. They're created in my image. 120,000 image bearers who are broken and lost. Of course I'm going to go after them. And so the invitation for Jonah is the same as the invitation for the older brother and the prodigal son. Would you like to join the party? And it's left open-ended. Maybe Jonah changed. Maybe he didn't. Maybe the older brother went to the party. Maybe he didn't. But there's hope, isn't there? And so, the heart of the Father is mercy for the nations. And God wanted Jonah, God wanted Israel, God wants the church today, God wants you and me to share his heart. And so he holds this book up as a mirror to all of us. And if he had a one-to-one -one with us about our hearts and our understanding of missions, what would he say? Surely one of them would be a question. Shouldn't I pity those enemy of yours? And so the book of Jonah ends with a question, and I want to end with a question. Do you share God's heart of mercy for the lost? Do you share God's heart of mercy for your enemies? Where's your heart? Where is it? 